Welcome, everybody, to Fan Stream Sports, powered by DSP Media. This is the Fighting Irish Daily Blitz, and I'm your host, Rob Fitoff, also known as RPT. You can find me on X at Pete Fitoff. So for episode 98 today, it's going to be the Tennessee State recap from yesterday's game. And then also, I want to discuss, I watched some other games yesterday, not the entire games, but just bits and pieces. But I noticed for both the NBC telecast at night for their Big Ten coverage, and then some non-televised games that were not on NBC. I just made some observations, and I know it's not certain yet that Notre Dame will go back to NBC for all their home games being televised. I believe we started that contract back in 1991, and that ends in 2025. But let me just put it this way. According to my opinion, I think we could do better. We'll get into that a little bit later. But first things first, head over to our website at fanstreamsports.com. There's tons of other podcasts out there, other additional information that I think you would all enjoy. And then also, if you have an Android device or an Apple device, download the FanStream Sports app. Also, head over to our Facebook page, like our page. There's additional information out there as well. So for episode 98, Tennessee State recap, I have numerous notes here. This may seem a little bit I don't want to say disorganized, but I kind of have my thoughts everywhere here as I was watching the game. And that's how I'm going to do this podcast here. So first things first, I, as expected, it was sloppy early on, both both the offense, even though I believe they scored on every single drive in the first half. But the offensive line was a little bit, uh, the communication wasn't there. Aldrick Estime had some really decent runs, but then he also had a couple, you know, three, four, five yard losses just because, uh, Tennessee State's defense were just blowing our line. I shouldn't say blowing our line off. I just think there was some miscommunication there. But um, some negative yards, let's just put it that way. But the big thing to me, and this has to get better, especially next week, because the schedule really, to me, the season starts next week with NC State. At NC State, uh, we should win that game, but that game could be tricky. That's a trap game. And uh, we had poor tackling, not just early in the game, but even later in the game when we were dominating uh, Tennessee State. Uh, that the poor tackling has got to get fixed. And uh, I, I got to say, our tackling wasn't as good as it was against Navy uh, for that triple option. Uh, special teams, we had a breakdown. We were up 28 to three, and then they had a 58 yard kickoff return. And our defense ended up holding them, and they ended up missing a field goal. So that was the good thing there. But special teams, a little bit shaky again, but all of the, uh, there's no field goal attempts. Uh, by Spencer Schrader, but he did, uh, he was perfect for all his uh, extra points after touchdowns. Sam Hartman, he wasn't as good as he was against Navy, but he was still pretty damn good. He, uh, he was sloppy in one drive, but the last drive of the half, I told you during the uh, uh, preview show for Tennessee State, we needed to get the tight ends involved more. And we did that yesterday in a big way, especially that last drive before the first half. Uh, I believe there was maybe less than a minute ago or just a minute. And if this was not to badmouth Coach Kelly, if this was Coach Kelly, we would take an E, go into the half with the 28-3 to three lead that we had, I believe, at the time. No, he lets Sam Hartman just sling it. He goes six for six. I believe it was 80 yards. He uh, There's four uh, receptions from the tight ends. Mitchell Evans had three receptions. And then Holden Stace had one, and that was the touchdown to end the first half. But that end of the drive or that last drive of the first half that was just a to me i know it's tennessee state's the competition but to me that was showing you that we have an elite quarterback this year to just go right down the field he looks so in control uh the protection was great for him just so smooth and i said it before i know it's tennessee state but drew pine couldn't do that last year tyler buckner couldn't do that last year and further Tyler Buckner is not the starter at Alabama right now. They released the starter. He's not the starter. And Drew Pine's not the starter at Arizona State. You're seeing how much we were limited by our quarterback play last year. With that end of the half drive by Sam Hartman, 6-6, six 80 yards. He hits the tight ends for four receptions. Holden Stace, tight end, gets the touchdown. Just a perfect drive. But he's got to do that against... Uh, more quality competition as well. I want to see him do that against NC State, OSU, Clemson, and USC. We shall see if that happens. What else? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had for the no, I didn't. The first we had our first turnover yesterday, but I can't really fault Devin Ford for fumbling that ball. I think 
that was just a big time hit. It should have been targeting for one, uh, for one, the rest and even, uh, and I hate to complain about the rest, but this is the way I see it. Uh, they at least should have reviewed that. They didn't even review it at all. And then we get a targeting that wasn't a targeting later in the uh, second quarter, I believe. And I mean, he just took a big time hit to the head. And I think he may have been knocked out at one time. He did not return to the game. I got to think he's probably got a concussion. If that's the case, he's probably out the next two games against NC State. And I think it's either Western or Central Michigan we play. In any event, I hope he's back for the Ohio State game. But even the strongest football player, or let's just say Jerome Bettis, would have fumbled that ball. So it is a turnover, but I put an asterisk right there. Anyone would have fumbled that ball is what I'm trying to say. Um, after that fumble, though, our defense really locked down. You know they were playing a little bit sloppy early on because that first drive that Tennessee State had, they moved the ball pretty well against us. But they, that to me right there, I just see it, that relentless attitude. And the offense did that as well because they kept scoring. Marcus Freeman really didn't take – he did take Sam Hartman out for the second half, and that was a smart move. You don't want him to get hurt when you're up 35-3. to three. And Steve Angeli does need some experience – uh, because he, him or Kenny Minchie will be the starter next year because Sam Hartman, this is his last year. But in any event, he he did not let the gas or let the uh, foot off the gas pedal is what I'm trying to say for both offense and defense. And Al Golden, the defensive coordinator, he kept dialing up blitzes because they just could not stop it. But I will say about those blitzes, we'll get into the stats a little bit later. I think even though we pressured and we're putting some pretty good hits on both of their quarterbacks, we only had one sack. Uh, Maris Leofau, he is playing a lot better than he did last year. And he is trying very hard. I mean, he was diving at the quarterback probably three times and just missed him. Still can't get a sack. I mean, he's just this close getting a sack. I don't know if he's ever had a sack at Notre Dame. But there was about three uh, instances yesterday that I saw. Like Maris missed again. Maris missed again. Maris missed again. So... As great of the pressure we had, and we were just dominating after a while, that relentless attitude, uh, we still couldn't sack them. I think it was just once, but we'll get into that a little bit later. And to me, kind of a movie pop culture reference. And I'm saying these these guys are not dirty players at all, but they're kind of taking that attitude of Karate Kid 3. Uh, remember uh, Terry Silver? He's in the Cobra Kai series on Netflix as well. To me, he's the best villain. Uh, I know Sensei Kreese is a... Uh, John Kreese, that is, he's to me, or to me, not to me, but to many, he's the big villain in this whole uh, Cobra Kai saga, Karate Kid saga. But to me, Terry Silver, uh, to me, is the most favorite villain, at least in my opinion. But I remember, and I have it here, he said this in Karate Kid 3, and he said, I'm going to make them suffer and suffer and suffer. And when I think they've suffered enough, then I start with the pain. And I think that's what this defense is really doing right now. They are just making this these teams whether it's navy last week or tennessee state yesterday just suffer and suffer then they bring the pain it's just that relentless non-stop uh, despite a little bit sloppy start to to start the game yesterday they will not let up al golden kept dialing up those blitzes yesterday and that quarterback was taking some shots and even with the offensive line uh we just kept pounding and pounding away uh we would not let up even when steve angeli was in there but we like i said have that Cobra Kai attitude right now, but we're not playing dirty is what I'm trying to say. We're, we're still playing within the game and uh, not taking it to where uh, uh, we're taking cheap shots. That's what I'm trying to say there. So let's get into the stats real quick here. Total domination by Notre Dame, 26 first downs to 12 for Tennessee State. Total yards, 557 Notre Dame, 158 Tennessee State. Um, let's see here. Rushing, 221 for Notre Dame. Only 91 for Tennessee State. Great job by the defense there. Well, we forced two turnovers. We had two interceptions. We had a pick six with Clarence Lewis. And then I believe Ramon Henderson had a uh, pick as well. And then the turnover, as I mentioned earlier with uh, Devin Ford, anybody would have had that fumble uh, with the shot he took. So hopefully Devin's going to be okay. Uh, we'll probably find out with uh, Marcus Fr or Coach Freeman's press conference tomorrow. Time of possession, 33 minutes to 26 for Tennessee State. Uh, so let's get into the actual box scores. I'm not going to go through everything here. Sam Hartman just played the first half, and then Coach Freeman, a smart move, got him out, get some experience for Steve Angeli, and then also for true freshman uh, Kenny Minchie. Uh, 
Sam Hartman, 14 out of 17, 195 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, and that awesome, perfect drive to end the half. And I said this, I, I, I know I'm repeating myself here, but I know that was against Tennessee State. But he looked, if he does that against quality competition, uh, let's say like USC, uh, OSU, the big three, USC, OSU, and Clemson, even next week against NC State, I'm going to start thinking, I'm not trying to hype this up. He's he's going to be very, at least not 100% similar, but similar to starting to get to that point of 2019 Joe Burrow. I'm not saying that's going to end up that way, but if he keeps this up, start making comparisons. I can see some comparisons with Joe Burrow of 2019 and that great LSU team. Steve Angeli, he wasn't perfect, but this is the first major actions he's had as a redshirt freshman. 8 of 11, 130 yards, two touchdowns, zero interceptions. So great job, Steve. And then Kenny Minchie, 2 of 2 for 12 yards. Aldrick Estimate, even though he had a couple uh, carries for negative yards when the line just wasn't communicating well, 13 carries, 116 yards, one TD. Jeremiah Love, the true freshman, is looking great. Five carries, 46 yards, uh, one touchdown, the first touchdown we had of the game. Jabron Payne, 6 for 27. Sam Hartman, 4 of 14. Uh, as he dodged some defenders. Uh, let's see here. And then Jadarian Price, he didn't rush much yet, rush much yesterday. Sorry, got tongue, tongue tied there. But remember last week, his first carry, he had a touchdown. His first reception yesterday from Steve Angeli, he gets a touchdown too. So look at the receivers. Uh, Jaden Thomas, 462. Mitchell Evans getting the tight ends involved like I wanted uh, last or with the pregame or the uh Preview show for Tennessee State earlier last week. Four receptions, 61 yards. Jadarian Price, two for 51. Jabron Payne, two of 45. Uh, Rico Flores, two of 31. Uh, Jane Greathouse, true freshman, two of 31. So let's just see here. From all three quarterbacks, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 13 different uh, players that caught a ball yesterday. That's great distribution, just great depth. We're seeing how deep this Notre Dame team is. Here's my only criticism of yesterday. And it was part of my Tennessee State preview. Tobias Merriweather, he only had uh, one catch. Was it one catch or zero catches against? Yeah, it was zero catches against Navy. And I said, he's got to get involved yesterday. Two catches, five yards. We're going to need him for those, those big games coming up. So I don't know what's going on there. I know other teams or other uh, players are stepping up. Earlier podcast I had this year about you know, some players are just not going to have it during the game or uh, they're being uh, targeted so much by the other team that they're, uh, you know, they're honing in on Tobias Merriweather. So then Jadarian Price has to step up. Or not Jadarian Price, uh, Jaden Thomas is what I'm saying because Jaden Thomas is a receiver. But anyway, I'm trying to say in that podcast, not everyone is going to have a great game every game, but this is two games in a row where Tobias Merriweather has just been nowhere so I don't know what's going on there. He has got to get involved. It's working out okay for now, but this can't happen for OSU, Clemson, and uh, USC. But we did fumble once. Defensively, we were led by Howard Cross with six tackles. J.D. Bertrand, five. Jason Onye had five. And then that one sack we had was Jordan Patello. So only one sack, but we really got great pressure. So what else here? Um... I think that's about it. I'm still saying 10 and two for uh, this year because we haven't really played a great team yet. And I know Ohio State looked not great yesterday. Their quarterback situation looks worse than I thought, but it's the first game. I will say this though, had we played Ohio State the first game this year, I think we probably win, but it's gonna be there. So they got, let's see, we have two more games. So they'll have two more games before they come to South Bend. And until, I can't say this, until we actually beat them, I'm still not going to pick uh, us to beat Ohio State until it actually happens is what I'm trying to say. And I think they're going to be a lot better team uh, once when they get to South Bend. They always say a college football team or even an NFL team, you make the most progress from week one to week two. So I got to think they're going to get, get better. And that was just the first game for them with a the new quarterback. So I didn't think it would be as bad as it was. But I see this be, that team being very good when they come to South Bend in late September. So 
Having said that, I think I'm just looking over my notes here because they're all over the place. Uh, okay. So here's my bitching and complaining uh, part of the podcast. You would think, hey, we win. Oh, I didn't mention the score. We won 56 to three. Uh, you know, we beat Navy last week. What was it 35 to three? Let's go back to that. I think that was 35 to three. Uh, 42 to three. <laughs> it's even better. So we beat Navy 42 to three. So what am, what am I going to bitch and complain about right now? As I watched the other games yesterday, I was watching Ohio State and Indiana. It was at Indiana. Indiana's never good in football. And CBS has part of that contract for Big Ten this year, too. So they do the day games, I believe. And then NBC, if it's not a Notre Dame night game, uh, they will have a Big Ten night game. So... They do not have the SEC anymore, CBS, but I was just kind of interested. I'm like, how are they going to do the, I mean, OSU, yes, they're a powerhouse, but Indiana, if that game's on ESPN or the Big Ten Network, it's just going to be a very boring game to watch. CBS does it again. As I said earlier, when they televised a lot of Notre Dame games uh, back in the early days when I was a kid in the 80s, they just, the sound is so much greater. The announcers are so much better. They made the OSU-Indiana game feel like an SEC game. Uh, and those SEC games, they always just, even if it wasn't a quality opponent, let's say like a Mississippi against, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, Texas A&M. And Texas a let's say Texas A&M was struggling for the year and they're playing Mississippi State or Mississippi. Just the way the announcers were, the sound quality, that great music that's now going on probably 40 years, that preview music that uh, CBS has, just their whole presentation makes the game seem bigger than it actually is but it's great to watch they made that ohio state indiana game look like a prime time matchup and that's saying something right there and then i'm watching the notre dame game and i know it's a blowout into the second half all you hear from these mediocre announcers at nbc we don't even really have a pre-game show either that was the thing during the notre dame preview show or even at the halftime they're previewing and having all this special hoop or uh, hubbub, hoopla, whatever you want to call it, for the Penn State West Virginia game, hyping up that Big Ten night game more than Notre Dame, who's been with you now since 1991. You think they would treat Notre Dame a little bit better. But no, during the second half, when that game was a blowout, all you hear about is Eddie George, how he was on Broadway. He's a, a former actor, former Heisman Trophy. Okay, I get it. But that's pretty much all you hear in the second half. You also hear about Deion Sanders, and that was a great story too. He's now the coach at Colorado. His two sons play on Colorado, and his son threw for 500 yards yesterday. Great upset win at TCU. They're talking about Deion Sanders in Colorado during the second half. And I know Jack Con he was sick again. I don't know if he has COVID or what, but he was out again, and he's no better. I will say at least, I think it's Paul Bergmeister who does the play-by-play. He's a little bit better. And then uh, I and Eagles kid that did the Navy game. But Jason Garrett is just, I know he's probably trying. I, I know he's probably a really nice guy, but he's just so dry. And you can tell he's trying. They're trying to make him more of a, uh, what do you want to call it, a people person or a social person. It's just not working. He's just, I'm trying to think of a word. I remember John Macron used to say, he's would say, Yvonne Lendl Lendell works a lot harder than me and it shows he's ranked higher than me, but he has the personality. My pinky has more personality than Yvonne Lendl. I feel the same with Jason Garrett. He's just not, maybe he'll get better down the road, but why are you putting just uh, novices to do Notre Dame games? It reminds me of, I grew up near Lima, Ohio in the TV station there. Yes, they have some veteran reporters there. But a lot of kids right out of college work there. They get their feet wet and then they move into uh, bigger markets like Columbus, Cleveland, you name it. But like the Limas, the Mansfields, those smaller communities, they get these kids right out of college. So they're just kind of getting their feet wet. That's what NBC does. They get these new play-by-play, -play, new analysts like Jason Garrett, who was coaching in the NFL. And then they put them in one of their biggest uh, uh, programming uh, sports programming uh being notre dame football and they just hand it to them why not put some experts in there and the thing is when i'm watching the penn state not the whole one the, the whole game but the penn state west virginia game 
they put so much more effort into that game. The sound quality, for one, was better than what it is at Notre Dame. And Notre Dame had a packed house. I don't know why. It just seems they, the Big Ten, this is the first time they had Big Ten in, I don't know, forever. And that's the thing, too. Prior to, even in the 80s, really NBC football coverage was just for the Bulls. I remember they used to have the Rose Bowl, Orange Bowl, Fiesta Bowl. They had a lot of the Bulls back in the day. And that was it. They didn't have like the weekly Big Ten game of the week or Pac-10 at the time or Big 8, whatever. Once they signed Notre Dame in 1991, that was pretty much their college football exposure. And then they would have a couple bowl games here and there. So you've had Notre Dame for all these years now. But you're putting all your time and effort into the Big Ten. Heck, at this point, even though I could care less whether Notre Dame joins a conference or not, if it takes us to join the Big Ten to finally get some better coverage, you know, so be it. But I just, I, I couldn't believe, for one, I was expecting CBS to have better coverage for Big Ten. As I said earlier, they made that production look bigger than it actually was, or better than it actually was. But during the Notre Dame second half, all they had was talking about Eddie George, uh, how he was an actor, but then Tennessee State got him to uh, coach now in his third season. They're talking about Deion Sanders in Colorado. There's really no mention about Notre Dame. Why don't you do a segment on Sam Hartman? This is his first year at Notre Dame. Last week, they were in Ireland. Why didn't you talk some sort of segment on Ireland? They could have had a... Uh, a program during the week, prime time to say, hey, Notre Dame's playing Ireland this week. Here's some special coverage. We're at this bar from Ireland, uh, an hour special. And then, hey, the game's on at 2.30 just to promote it more. Nothing, nothing at all. We get the short end of the stick. To me, this is like a, uh, God, what, what type of marriage do they call that? A strange marriage where whatever spouse it is, uh, let's say they're just the breadwinner where they give the other spouse money to do whatever, they do whatever, they meet up during the holidays to say, oh, we're so in love, but they're really not. It's just an estranged marriage. And to me, NBC maybe, maybe they make a better, I know Under Armour made a better financial offer than Nike and Adidas, and that's why we went with Under Armour again. And that's probably gonna be the case with NBC. And I know our, two, our uh, athletic director to be, Pete Bavacqua, is coming from NBC. So maybe there's some ties there. But I'm just saying, just because they're giving us the most money and then they just forget about us and we don't care. They're giving us the most money. They treat us like an estranged spouse in this estranged marriage. And they just go, go from there. And I just think if we go to CBS. And to me, I know the, the big thing is just wins and losses. But we're just missing an opportunity just to promote Notre Dame even further. Even though we're that national brand, NBC is doing us no favors with their TV coverage. I mean, yesterday, it just it was just right in my face, more or less. And I'm just like, I hope Notre Dame sees this. Don't be this in this estranged marriage, even though it looks like you're going to be in it again. It looks like you're going to renew after 2025. But you're just that spouse, you know, they're giving you the money. But then they forget about you uh, 365 days of the year, pretty much. Or 364. What do you want to say? But I can't say it enough. Uh, CBS does a hell of a lot better coverage. They make Big Ten football look like the SEC, especially yesterday with uh, Ohio State and Indiana. And their primetime coverage for Penn State and West Virginia last night was a hell of a lot better than they treated Notre Dame since 1991. And here's my last point on this. At the end of the game last night, or it was around about 6.48, because I was, I was checking this just to see if they would do this, and they did it. They interviewed Coach Freeman about 6.48, and they're just about ready to show Notre Dame uh, when the football team sings to the student body, the alma mater. And at 6.48, I'm like, okay, there's no time restrictions here because I think the coverage for Penn State, West Virginia started at seven. They cut off. They go right to when it's 648, they're just about ready to show the football team singing to the student body, the alma mater. They cut off the coverage and they go to the Penn State, West Virginia preview show, which Notre Dame really doesn't even get a preview show. And then at the end of the game, <laughs> West Virginia uh, and uh, Penn State, Penn State wins that game. Penn State goes to their student body to sing their alma mater. 
And there's about 10 minutes left before new, local news coverage. What do you know? They show the entire part of Penn State singing to their student body. And then Todd Blackledge, who's the analyst for the game, who went to Penn State, uh, the e Iron Eagles kid, I forget his uh, name, but I just call him Iron Eagles' son, says, well, what would you think about that, Coach Todd? Uh, or not, or, or uh, he said, what do you think about that to uh, Todd Blackledge, who's the analyst, saying, uh, oh, that's great to see your alma mater uh, being sung by the football team to the student body. That was great. They made uh, a point to let them know that, yes, this is what Penn State does, um, similar to Notre Dame. And uh, they made a whole, I don't want to say an event out of it, but they gave more coverage to Penn State than they did in Notre Dame, who's been with them since 1991. The spouse, that estranged spouse is what I'm trying to say. So that's my soapbox right there, my bitch and complain moment. Um, but to me, it's just, I don't know. It, I, it, it's the least of our worries, I guess, but I just think Notre Dame can really get that brand out there even further, whether they went to CBS or Fox or heck, even ABC. I just think NBC is just doing them a disservice right now. I can't say it enough. Um, so I'll leave it at that. But uh, thank you so much for joining me for episode 98. And as always, go Irish.